evening, everyone. Um, sorry for the delay. There's been a bit of uh, bad traffic tonight. I think some of you have seen that. I guess um, it's hitting us as we are talking about ecology. Uh, so, um, thank you for coming for this uh, yet another uh, present lecture of this season. We are getting towards the end. Um, it's been uh, a long time that Lila has been interested in questions of health and naturally, as in everything else, we connect health uh, with a larger context. So it's health and politics, health and um, environment, health and economy. And um, we're very happy to have uh, Ritu Priya Mehrotra tonight to talk to us because this is how she has been um, understanding health uh, for the last few decades as she has been uh, working on uh, those questions. Um, actually, some of you might remember that we finished last year's Prism Lecture Series uh, with the discussion on health with, uh, with the Srinath Reddy um, on the question of uh, universal health coverage. And more recently, you might have read on our website, Lila Interactions, a series of debates, uh, of dialogues, which actually uh, we organized on questions of health and one more time connecting health to larger settings, larger sets of problems. So we had Ebola in September with uh, Christian Nkanu from um, Congo and uh, Pachaul Almaswami from uh, Mizoram and, uh, on Ebola. And again, we understood that Ebola must be understood um, culturally. And it's not just a question of uh, medicine and chemistry, but um, health must understand the, understand the context in which it works. More recently, we have had an exchange on AIDS, HIV AIDS, topic on which you have been uh, working um, with the Glory Alexander from the Asha Foundation in Bangalore and uh, Rajesh um, Talwar, the writer. And uh, tomorrow, actually, we have an exchange on um, Bhopal and um, climate in the context of the Peru UN convention that is happening right now. And um, Satinat Sarangi will write along with Thomas Crowley. Um, so, you see, we have been uh, uh, trying to look at this in this particular way. And this season, uh, as we were talking about culture as continuum, we want to bring health within the frame of culture. And this is the kind of, this is the sense of culture that we, that we want to reaffirm. Not just the culture of the arts, but the culture of everything that surrounds us, everything that gives sense to our values and our society, basically. Um, so I'm very happy to introduce you to uh, Priya Mehrota. She's been uh, in JNU at the Center for Social Medicine and Community Health since 1990. She's a professor in JNU. Um, she's been focusing on public um, policy around health trying to develop uh, and um, propagate a perspective of holistic epidemiology, uh, looking at the implication of health policy on migrant labor, the urban poor, on the Dalits, questions of nutrition as well, and so largely connecting epidemiology with political economy and health culture. Uh, she has also worked as an advisor for the public health planning at the National Health Systems Resource Center, and she has been part of uh, numerous national and international research collaborations and committees. Um, to introduce her tonight, we are happy to have Savia Sachi. Thank you for coming. <coughs> He's the head of the department of the sociology of the sociology department in Jamia Melia Islamia University in Delhi, um, and. Um, it's quite, again, it's the same type of uh, understanding, uh, connecting ecology and environmental issues uh, within the frame of sociology and political economy as it is, as it is understood today. he has been a visiting faculty at the International Honors Program in Boston, uh, as well as the Department of Conservation Architecture in uh, uh, SPA, Delhi, and in the National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad. And uh, is he has edited the book Between 
the sky and the earth in 2005. And before that, in 1988, he authored Tribal Forest Dwellers and Self Rule. I'll give the mic to Sagar Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> and uh, before we hand over the mic to Ritu, I just want to say a few words to introduce uh, Ritu. As I know her, having worked with her uh, over the past several years, uh, and also it will foreground the topic of discussion today. Ritu, to me, is a person who brings together a certain notion of interdisciplinary work, uh, which requires a very, very close, intimate touch with the field. Uh, and I think uh, it's a quality that we look forward to, but it's very difficult to come by because institutions are not very friendly to uh, bridging the gap between does and uh, what happens on the ground and what activists in India do. Uh, and uh, we try very hard to bridge this gap. And some of us can't do it, but it is one person who has done it very well. Uh, she also is a MBBS doctor, which brings a good amount of technical, uh, hardcore knowledge into social sciences and social economy. Uh, and having uh, taught students and valued researches uh, which cut across this field, I think she has a lot of uh, rich experience and insight into uh, public health and other issues of, of, of culture. Uh, this topic today is very, very interesting and very stimulating because, uh, as we all know, India is a very ancient civilization and uh, we have a huge cultural repertoire and archive. Uh, which can both be an asset and a liability. Uh, and the asset of our culture is that there are certain traditions which are continuous and has been lasting over several centuries. Uh, in today's world of discontinuity, especially in the field of health, uh, we have lost a sense of what health actually means. Uh, we are more determined by what uh, systems of uh, medicine determine for us what it has and those actually parameters given to us by diagnostics. Uh, the notion of health actually comes to us through traditions of living in a different way. Uh, for instance, the food that ancestors used to eat included health as a part of the culture. Today we don't know that. Today food is nutrition and calories and carbohydrates. Uh, there is no notion of food that we have and I think it's uh, that's a good question. So with this uh, understanding of the subject, uh, to begin with, I hand over to my to to tell us more about uh, the culture of health. Thank you, Sachi, for uh, introducing the interdisciplinarity part of it, uh, because that's really what uh, made me a, you know, a little... Uh, except the invitation that Rizio so kindly gave with a bit of trepidation. Coming from public health and a medical background, you know, one has been um, dabbling in or dealing with different dimensions and different segments of our society and trying to understand that. And then, of course, culture becomes a part. Uh, but to think of it as a broad brush picture of what health culture means as continuity across Uh, societies and across time uh, is something that I've been feeling for a long time that we don't do in public health and that's a self-introspective critique saying that we need to do much more of that. So I'm grateful that I got this opportunity and I thought I'd take it in that way. And therefore what I present today would be a way of trying to get feedback on developing these ideas and getting them further for public health and for policy makers and planners to try and think uh, in a way beyond medicine as uh, Sachi said. Um, since the area is so wide, uh, what I'll really be doing is creating a kind of collage for us um, to see the uh, range of issues and how do we then try and bring them together and bring a common understanding uh, and a framework for ourselves. Um, the first thing that we think of when we think of health culture, there are different images that come and uh, different ways in which health culture itself has been conceived. The commonest that one hears all the time uh, is that okay? 
um, is the uh, most popular one which the colonial anthropologists gave us of the primitive backward who were doing things which is traditional and therefore that is what is health culture. The other which we think of today is the one of the middle class urban pill popping culture which we buy pills of, across from the chemists and that's what has become the big culture for today. So these are two different ways in which we can look at health culture. But it's also about the medical system and what the doctor does and what the, uh, is done in a hospital. And that's health culture too. And the third is traditional forms of formal forms where you have traditional experts giving us uh, different ways of uh, dealing with health and illness. Now all these four together, or which of it are, is it that we're thinking about? Uh, what is it that first comes to mind for us? I try to look at what is it that different perspectives of anthropologists give us, since health culture is what we're talking about, and very clearly there are three streams which influence and interact with policy as well. Um, one is the anthropologists who come from an ethnocentric perspective that technology is the only thing which is good and therefore the rest of it is backwardness and needs to be, therefore the native needs to be civilized and brought to the point where they can understand and deal with modernity and modern medicine. And these are examples of that. The uh, popular religion and folklore is during the British 1894 is when this was written. And religion and folklore is really what brings, is, includes the health culture. And that's what's contained within it. But we have others working on this through the 50s and 60s. The whole effort being to see that the benefits of modern medicine and development are brought to the masses. And therefore these studies are all in that vein, trying to see how that happens. And how people are resisting change. Health culture is resistance. And we have to now overcome that. Um, through various forms of intervention. Goal here, I uh, put in a quote there to see the kind of language that is used by somebody who is much more sympathetic. Gold is one of the most sympathetic anthropologists, but he is talking about a North Indian village of Sherupur. There prevails an overall non-scientific approach to disease, which the villagers call country medicine or village medicine. They see the why, assume is what was said to be. Essentially, it is a complex assortment of common sense remedies and supernaturalistic ritualism, which has grown up over time in an effort to cope with sickness in a systematic and predictable manner. Although some of the specific portions administered under the aegis of this folk system of medicine has a genuinely salutary effect, the villager himself is largely unaware of and unconcerned with rational bases for the system's validity. In his eyes, it is a body of traditionally sanctioned, ready-made formulae interwoven with the supernatural to be resorted to in times of need. If we try and transpose this to today and talk about how people use modern medicine, don't think it would be too different. It's not that we understand what the doctor tells us to do, but we do it and follow it in any case and go ahead with getting, giving our children vaccines and so on and so forth uh, without knowing exactly what they mean. The second is the developmentalist approach which is more sympathetic to the native and the primitive, saying that it's not that their culture is a barrier, but the fact that they haven't got access to modernity is the, bad, is the problem. And the minute you, they got access to roads and transport and doctors and hospitals, they would then change their behavior and their understanding, and they would then become developed and accept modern medicine. So the blame is not, doesn't lie on them, but it changes elsewhere. And uh, statements like development is the best contraceptive and so on are examples which illustrate that. Uh, there was an attempt of a third kind, which I would categorize as a more holistic approach, where, um, as the introduction was made, where health culture is seen as a more composite whole, where people's perceptions, the experts that we saw earlier, so all the four images that I gave you, are actually parts of the health culture, and all have to be seen together to understand health culture as a whole. Now, all of these are really talking about medicine and treatment in some way. And therefore, they are talking about medical culture and not really health culture. Health culture has to be more than that. And health culture, therefore, is a composite whole of popular and expert knowledge and practice on a continuum which is interlinking the expert and the uh, layperson or popular people. But it's not just treatment of illness. It goes well beyond that to understandings to the meanings people give to health and health related phenomena and then how they themselves devise ways of dealing with it in their everyday lives. 
to take a broad look at it, what you actually realize by doing that is what came to me and therefore you can see the evolutionary um, you know, picture there that we have before us um, of the fact that civilizations, the primary role has been of health as the primary beginner of civilizational shaping. Water and sources of food is the primary around which all civilizations had to begin and grow and that's about health. The rest of the factors which are commonly seen as primary and do influence and become components of health culture in my view is how the societies relate to their environment, food and nutrition, social stratification and how society gets shaped, gender and sexuality as outcomes also of that and finally of healthcare. And these together are what would constitute the primary elements of healthcare for any society. How does it get shaped in a, you know, if we look at it historically with a broad brush, we're looking at human beings coming into uh, the world on the planet, moving to the point where we get the civilizations and the ancient civilizations all on river banks, all related to food production in those areas and water access. The movement happens from one sort of ecosystem to another, one set of technologies to another, and you have the position moving from the, uh, you know, just as um, the greater examples, from the hunting-gathering kind of societies to the ones who got into agriculture and thereby um, got located uh, in certain locations um, and villages grew to the urban sites which had a mix of rural and agricultural, and finally to our industrial cities. All of these reflect not only the ecosystems they grew with, but also the way in which uh, attempt was made to deal with the four or five elements that I spoke about. And it's in that context that um, if one sees how um, from food and water being the primary needs for survival, um, and therefore, that being the primary production and mechanisms developed for that uh, were the secondary production mechanisms to support the primary. And so artisans come up, uh, equipment development, uh, subsequently industry to provide for that at one level. At another, the whole issue of uh, sexuality, reproduction, birth and death being the biggest phenomena of uh, which are unfathomable to this day and therefore needed explanation. And those explanations were what cultures provided to their people. And that is uh, the way in which it would come from religion and from science. And these were the two uh, elements of society which structured the way health cultures actually understood. Birth, death, disease, sexuality. Philosophies of life in fact grew out of the experience of health and ill health, and attempts to explain those. Um, in the process of this kind of development, when you, uh, you know, moving from uh, what we call hunting gathering primitive societies to the more uh, forms where um, you have surplus developing, you, therefore hierarchies and power structures come into force, um, the structuring of that and sexuality, reproduction, the needs for caring in different uh, biographies of each individual is where family and community structures got built. And it is this which therefore I'm saying is the primary, health being primary to structuring of societies. With the way social stratification happened, it also then meant that those at the lower end of the hierarchy and the power equation, the effect that that had on their survival and health meant that to continue that, they had to assert their own being, their identities, and assert their rights and needs for that and for basic needs and survival. And therefore, processes of mobilization, of assertion, of politics, all become again part of structures uh, other than the dominant. While points of time over uh, decades and millennia, a kind of balance develops 
between the biological and the cultural forms of handling these issues and thereby a kind of stability in the health problems and a low level of endemicity, as we would call it epidemiologically, points of transition is where health problems surface again in a big way because that stability is disturbed. And that is what one sees uh, most sharply when, for example, invasions happen or when technologies change. These are the two points where society gets destabilized, health problems surface as one of the biggest. And examples of that from um, industrialization and post-industrial Europe to um, the invasions, what happened to the Red Indians and decimation of them when the Europeans came in by the smallpox that the Europeans brought or in India when uh, colonialism uh, brought and spread syphilis on a wide scale in India. Uh, globalization and HIV come coterminous and therefore the implications of these coming together are uh, fairly well studied and understood also. So this link between the broad changes that happen and health and thereby the need for constantly looking for new ways of dealing with health and health problems as they arise. And this process of uh, the dynamicity of health problems not only at individual level which we all face through our biographies of birth and death but that societies face and populations face as collectives and thereby coming to deal with them as cultural forms. Uh, I'll sort of um, stop this process of trying to figure out how uh, health was figuring uh, in building of civilizations, but look more at how health cultures themselves are shaped. Disease patterns are always uh, structured by the ecosystems that people live in, and ecosystems thereby not only create the health problems, but also provide the resources to deal with them. Uh, it is that which is the primary shaper, and th this is what therefore we see, for example, in this graphic. Um, ways of de dealing with them evolve with the ecology, the problems, and the larger ways of life that have developed uh, over periods of time. Um, and this is where you see from ancient times uh, the development of Hippocrates, who's seen as the father of modern medicine, talking about our food should be our medicine, our medicine, our food, everyone has a doctor in him, we just have to keep working at it, and it is what we would be able to do ourselves. But also he is the one who goes on to talk about airs, waters, and situations or places, as a translation of the title of his work. So putting together airs, waters, places as the basis of illness, and ourselves, everyone having in him the way to understand and to deal with one's own illness is what Hippocrates <coughs> talks about, and that's what you find Charak and Ayurveda talk about. Um, and these are quotes there which similarly say the same thing. Charak advises human beings on the management of environment by inquiring into the quality of air, water, land and time. One should not use food articles from either attachment or ignorance. So multiple sites give you similar understandings. And um, this is about the Ritu Charya. Uh, which is the cycle, seasonal cycle, and Ayurveda gives you very detailed understanding of each season, what is the implications of that for bath, pit and cuff in the body, and what different foods will mean in that season, and thereby what should the food cycle be for you, and what should the daily routines be in consonance with that. Uh, Hippocrates, like I said, talk about air waters and situations, and Jarek also goes on to talk about the relationship between environment, health and ethics. And this is not an, only an individual ethics, it's also an ethics of society at large. The root cause of the derangement of wind or vayu, and before this couplet is talked about how vayu is a prime mover of the way health will be, the kind of vayu that is generated around us. It is also the loss of dharma or unrighteousness that leads to vitiation of vayu and that leads to ill health and illness in society. We have Buddha. His entire search came out of his exposure to the suffering caused to human beings by illness, disease, a old age and death. And that is what set him out to do his search and then brought about the philosophy of life that he did and which has influenced so many people and generations and civilizations. Uh, what I would like to move from is this idea of it's the philosopher and the physician 
who gives us ideas and who has the ideas to the common person and their ideas. And this is um, an example of uh, the kind of conceptual framework that one was able to understand of those who are considered illiterate and therefore ignorant and not knowledgeable about how um, health is affected and what they can do about it. A group of construction workers who were ex-untouchables and uh, today are construction workers and small cultivators. Uh, their understanding of health arose from their understanding their own experience with reference to the past of their own community and their forefathers, but also with reference to when they came to the city and the life in the village and the difference between these two. And the third was how they saw their own life with reference to the urban middle class and the professional urban middle class, which is the reference point today. So these three, with these three reference points, they recognized two things. One, they recognized that their well-being had improved over time, over their previous generations. The basic um, element of that being getting out of untouchability, and that colored everything else around it. But the other element, which was the surprise that I had with my theoretical understanding of public health, that they felt that health had deteriorated. So well-being improves and health deteriorates was counter to the public health I had learned, that when all of life improves and well-being improves, health will automatically improve. Now this was, they were telling me something entirely the opposite. So one had to make sense and understand that. What is it that they were saying in this? Their health, of, the, the components that they saw of health was longevity or mortality, illness and how much illness happened and its seriousness, and physique and stamina. How healthy is the body, how much can it work, can it do, etc. And these three are the elements that epidemiology uses today. That's what we use as experts. So they were very close to that sort of a public health or an epidemiological understanding. But to detail that understanding a little more, what were the determinants they saw of each of these? For well-being, the larger determinants came from three different sources, from individual merit of the individual, from societal context, so them as the urban poor or the Dalit in the village, and the supernatural forces. And these three are all there together simultaneously, layered, and they are interacting three elements, which cover the overall, the entire experience and shape it. But what are the further uh, details which are components of well-being for them, and are the determinants of health? So dignity is the primary, coming from their experience, historical experience, and the pleasant improvement that they saw in it. That included the economic as well as the untouchability dimension, but it was the dignity and what they called izzat, getting more izzat. But the second part of it was azadi. And azadi for them was not only getting out of begar or having to do labor without getting anything for it, but it was even more the freedom to consume the kind of items that they were, that they were banned from. Even if they could afford it, they could not have used certain items, for example, um, in their festivals, they could not distribute food which was made in ghee. Uh, they could not, wear, the women could not wear silver at all, and so on. And these had what became their symbols of getting out of what they call the ganda kaam chhodne ki ladai. As chamars, that was the work they were doing, and it was seen as polluting work, and therefore now getting out of that was a conscious mobilization as a collective that was done. So this understanding arouses, arises in that social context. And Therefore, the second part of it was getting out of physical labor. It's not more exercise as we would talk of today and the doctors would tell you today, but it is decreasing exercise and decreasing manual physical work, which was important. And the third was access to diets, better diets, amenities, health care now being more available and so on. Legal and social relationships was also a very important thing that was foregrounded, more by the women, because that was uh, something which they seemed to experience more, also because they left their children back home, especially the sons, to study at home in the village. Counterintuitive again, you come to the cities and to bigger and bigger cities to study. They went back, they left their sons home because the village was where they could ensure a school, not in the city. That's not where they could get it. And then lastly, the supernatural forces, which I've just put into that shaded to say that that's not the big thing that colors their understanding of health and death or birth. That's a small component of the larger whole. 
where the natural and the supernatural act together and the explanation that they largely gave had a large component of the natural in it and not just the supernatural as it is sometimes depicted. Now this kind of an understanding also included when they looked at their own ill health and disease and compared it for example, they were very clear that coming to the city meant worse health. And how was it worse health? Their children back home had better space to move around in but other than that they had support for child care, they had weaning foods which they would not have here and so on and there were the nature of accidents that the children suffered. Therefore that was one element. The other which one could visibly see oneself, the kind of hard labor they had to do here, picking up more than 50, 55, 60 kilos of load on their head. 15 days after they were here, you could see the weight loss on each individual woman. And it was a, you know, self-evident in that itself. But what they talked about in terms of their understanding was, you know, when this woman, for example, looks at her child very sadly, who is um, 10 year old and says, now he's so short. Now all his life he'll be ill. He'll keep getting illness so quickly all his life. Now she's connecting very clearly the nutrition status of the child and its capacity to get ill uh, in the future as well. And she recognized that. It's not, we don't have to teach her about the fact of nutrition and all this, that the child needs to be fed better. She talks about the fact, you know, why do you get more ill? You say it's more unhealthy. Again, here we are, all our health education is trying to teach them about cleanliness, swachhata abhyans have to be done and so on. But they are clear where they are getting their illness from. And therefore, these are uh, the conceptions that they themselves harbor. And these are connect the well-being and the health and the components of health are all knitted together in their understanding. If we counterpose this with what we see um, as the present day ways in which public health and the bureaucrat and the technocrat deal with health and illness. Um, what we have seen uh, across periods is if you're looking at the Indus Valley for example, uh, you have the planned cities on the Indus River and its tributaries which have these public baths which have drains and an underground drainage system in Lothar, this is in Lothar, the previous one was Harappa and what we are seeing here uh, is you know, uh, a century and a half old um, ways in which expert planning was done. What happens post-industrial revolution in Europe? We have these cities which we know classically harbored a lot of illness one, going back to them from the colonies, where they had brought illness, but then they took back illness with them. Uh, but it was also because of the nature of high density of workers living there, the bad working conditions in which they lived and so on, documented by angels and conditions of the working class in the 1840s and 50s so well, and in Charles Dickens' novels and all of those, which we see as the harbingers of high levels of disease and epidemics. And that is became the beginning point for the discipline of public health to develop and town planning to develop. Both arose to deal with the health problems of health in these cities uh, of Europe. And so you uh, see the enormity of it, for example, in this billboard put up which says, Cholera, the Dudley Board of Health announces that churchyards at Dudley being so full, no one who has died of cholera will be permitted to be buried after Sunday tomorrow or in the burial ground and so on. So this is the kind of extent of uh, disease that they are seeing and experiencing and having to deal with. Thereby you have a whole cleaning up of the European cities and uh, both in terms of planning of land use but also of water, sanitation systems, um, of pasteurization of milk, sewage systems come into place, uh, land use and thereby dispersal of the population and all of those uh, develop. Uh, what you also have um, in this frame is of the granaries, which we, uh, I don't have a picture of that here, but we know were there in the Indus Valley towns uh, so, and to ensure food and food security as we call it today. Um, this is a picture of a farmer in present day uh, Krishna district in front of the storage bin that she has created for herself. 
this is what we have the HCI's go down. So this is the planned food security system that we are uh, at the moment being able to give ourselves. What is it that we do in terms of water and sanitation? These have always been the big issues for all societies which are trying to deal with the environment and health. And the way that has always been found is you separate the two. How do you separate water and sanitation? What we are attempting to eradicate today is open air defecation. But open air defecation arose in an ecosystem of the rural areas where there is large expanse of land, density of population is less, where open spaces have their own rules. And the rules are very clear. There are demarcated areas for defecation which are distant and not able to contaminate the water sources. And these rules are part of the cultural forms of open air defecation. It's also to be understood in a climate where water is always been a constraint. The monsoon comes only at certain periods of time and thereby the water in certain parts of the year will be very scarce and large parts of the country have a scarcity even at different points of time. Therefore, the open air and the sun being able to decontaminate is probably the best way of decontamination. Uh, or one of the ways of decontamination which certainly works. The rest, we, you, know, you can see across the other ways that got developed of dry latrines to be cleaned by human hand and night soil to be removed as it was called. Two pit latrines which are built so you don't have to clean them but you keep moving the toilet. Or you have septic tanks which have to be periodically cleaned and that becomes difficult and expensive and therefore doesn't happen and all the rest of that. Two these shining European and today in middle class India, the toilets that we have now. What do they mean? And what does each of these mean? Like I, I gave a brief of what the it means to the ecosystem and to what uh, decontamination means in terms of open air defecation. What does the sewage system mean? Which is the ideal that is put before us? You require pipes right through each house. You require them to take the sewage with water because they have to flow um, to centralized sewage plants which will decontaminate and then put it in the water and the sludge either into the river or into open air for maybe used for agriculture as recycling if there is entitled planning there. What does this sewage mean and what does it require? Any sewage system across the world requires human beings at some point of time to go down to clean it. And that's part of sewage system. It's not part of our context where we have not brought in engineering. Engineering has not provided an answer to how to clean sewage pipes without a human being going in. Therefore, what we see today, our problem is that we are not able to provide the kind of safety mechanisms that Europe is able to provide. So when it happens in Europe that a person has to go in and clean, it's announced, just as we do maybe for closing roads or for closing water supply, now you can get announcements. That announcement happens, the switch pipe is shut off for a while when the person has to go in, an ambulance stands outside, doctors stand outside, and you have a whole gear and mechanisms both for machines to go in and do part of the cleaning, and you have all this security mechanism around to deal with the problem. We don't have that. We have people going in in the night alone and so on and so forth and the deaths also that we know of. But besides the deaths, the everyday act of doing this kind of thing and what it means is what those switch systems are also about. Um, and these are done not only by... In, the Japan still has a caste and it's called a caste there which does cleaning and it still continues to do that to this day. So it, this is uh, a sort of larger phenomenon perpetuated by the sewage system the way we have developed it. And what happens to what goes out? This is what you see could be happening in Delhi with the pipes spewing it all out into the river. Uh, the data that we have for 2011 census tells us that 32% of urban Indians get a sewage system and 38% have additionally septic tanks and so on. So that makes it about 70% actually have toilets with these kind of systems. But we learn from the Pollution Control Board that only about 12% of the entire what is generated as sewage can be dealt with with the capacities that, we exist, that exist with us today. 
So we have only one third of the 32% which actually gets treated as sewage. So 10% of all the excreta disposal that happens in our urban areas happens through the sewage system. Today in 2011, after all these years of urbanization and development. And now we are saying we want to take urban amenities to rural areas. So how we do that is a puzzle to me in this particular context at least. So that leaves us therefore with a big conundrum of how do urban areas which definitely need some, they can't have the kind of open defecation that the rural area to the land is the uh, So therefore what is it that can be done and needs to be done? Um, but we need to see this as uh, a major issue which affects not only the immediate life of those who are involved in it, but also social structuring and uh, engineering works and what have you with it. Um, if we look at food, cultures, diets and ecosystems, what happens to those? Okay, let me just finish this. I haven't done finished with this yet. The other separation happens by the hands. One hand is for, washing, for eating and the other is for washing. And we all socialize into that, the right hand to eat, the left hand to wash. And wash after defecation is something we are teaching our children all the time. This is part of the socialization that happens when we are very young. But I realized while working with the Dalit women that I was privileged to live with as well, that when we, they had not been socialized in this. They used the right hand for washing even after defecation. This is a discontinuity in the culture. And it's a discontinuity which shows the social structure and how it was working. Did it also have a link with the kind of occupations and thereby does it go well? Those are explanations that would probably have to be dealt with uh, at greater depth by, late, you know, by others and so on. Um, but what has happened therefore is also then hand washing. And hand washing with soil, with rock, which is the most decontaminated and uh, purified substance, ash, which is available in all homes, is what is for long periods of time used, we came to soap. And today, we have hand sanitizers, which is what you see before you. Uh, and these became very popular, at least in our country, you suddenly started seeing them after H1N1 flu became the big story, globally. And what that also did uh, was the message being given, one was of course that you wash hands, but the other was, you don't shake hands any longer. Because when you shake hands, it's spread. So for us, that's all right. We troll our hands and say namaste. But for the Europeans, and I was, um, I heard the trauma of some of the European doctors. Um, when I saw this poster on their wall, which said, in the doctor's room, don't shake hands. And they are used to being polite with their patients. They welcome the patient when the, the, each doctor will get up and shake hands with the patient when they come in. So he says, now what do I do? And this is showing us how disease changes cultural forms. So now what about this sanitizer? Hmm? Um, I have to thank Ranveer for this calculation which he has done. It says if it kills 99.9% .9 of the germs in your hand, right? nothing kills 100%. So 99.9%. .9 now if you have something like 200 million germs on your hand, after having used the sanitizer, you still be left with 20,000. So what does it, you know, how far does it take us? Which is not to deny that washing hands has its importance, uh, but to keep things in perspective and to know what it is going to mean. Okay, to uh, move to food and food still, I uh, will try to do this quickly. But this picture is here because um, of the whole controversy about vegetarianism and non-vegetarian foods. And to understand, I think we need to understand it as an outcome of ecosystems again. People living in forests, uh, with game and uh, hunting uh, being the major uh, form of food production and large game available and including then uh, produce of the forest, vegetables and fruits, those would be the large uh, kinds of food patterns and dietary patterns as for example we can see even today in the northeast. Uh, what you would see in riverine areas and the coastal areas is fish forming a big part of the diets. Um, with agriculture cereals became a part everywhere, but cereals would grow around the year in some parts and not grow around the year in other parts. And the whole Ganga Jamini belt and parts of the west uh, from Rajasthan, Gujarat and so on is clearly in other parts of the country where you can't grow cereals the year round 
if you depend on the monsoon and rain water and uh, whatever surface water is available. Therefore, a large part of the diets was not only about cereals, it was about animal husbandry. And animal husbandry was a big part of food production in addition to forest produce. In the areas where that therefore was the source of milk and milk products, but also providing manure to the fields, also the cow providing the bullock for ploughing, and later then hide and so on, it formed a whole ecosystem economic complex. And therefore the privileging of the cow is to be seen in this whole context and not only as, um, to quote, um, I don't think I put it on the slide, um, an anthropologist Marvin Harris, who was said that I'm writing this paper because I believe that the irrational, non-economic and exotic aspects of the Indian cattle complex are greatly overemphasized at the expense of rational, economic and mundane interpretations. My intention is not to substitute one dogma for another, but to urge that explanation of taboos, customs and rituals associated with the manage of Indian cattle be sought in positive function and probably adaptive processes of ecological system of which they are a part. And what he then goes on to give details of, with data and so on, is to say that it is the um, banning of cattle um, and uh, cow slaughter or of uh, cow use of cow meat by the upper caste was a form of this kind of ecosystem economy sustenance but at the same time it was not that it was banned for everyone and the dead cattle could be consumed by and there is figures which he says about what figures of 25 million cattle and buffaloes dying every year in the country and therefore that's a large source of protein and other things which uh, is provided to large sections of the population, not only the lower caste, but also the Muslim, the Christian and so on, all of that. And this being allowed to do different things by different parts of the population is again an ecosystem adaptation in terms of allowing neither over uh, sustenance nor depletion. And that balance is maintained by both a biological and a cultural and social adaptation that this can be seen as with the ecosystems. Um, What it also includes is the whole notion of the fact that it's not the whole, it's seen as po and it's been posed today's in today's political mobilizations as Brahmanical and a Brahmanism and both ends seem to be indulging it in the in the same way. Banning cow slaughter for everyone is denying one dimension of the pluralism and the ecosystem and seeing it only as Brahmanism and therefore an imposition is the other side of it. And both probably need to also have this ecosystem's understanding and the pluralism that is inbuilt into it. Now I move to health care, which is what um, a major part of our understanding of um, health culture does come from. And uh, this what we see here is um, there is herbs being sold by probably somebody who's collected it from the forest and people would buy that as things that they would use as home remedies in their homes. They could also be bought by folk healers to use for their own their treatment with their patients. What we see here is the informal on the street, in this case a dentist. This is a folk informal Yunani practitioner. This is a woman practitioner from Sikkim who's got her little uh, bottles and so on also in front of her. These are all informal forms of the traditional healthcare and traditional knowledge systems. This is the formal and informal of the modern today, where we have the All India Institute in the background and in the foreground you see what we call the Jhola Chap doctor or the RMP. Uh, without an MBBS degree, but he's giving an injection and you can see all the bottles of medicine and so on behind them. And that's the latest addition to our uh, healthcare, the private corporate hospital. If we go to the traditional formal forms, you have the picture of the Rishi there, uh, who's codifying the system. The 
uh, Rajya Ved in the court to a point where you have the Brahmanical form of um, Ayurved uh, as it seems to be seen and the one on the top is Kotakal today which is uh, present day pharmaceuticalized sort of form providing mass level but with keeping the principles of the original Ayurved intact. And then you have the government Ayurveda college and the product of that. This is a Ved in front, sitting in front of the computer with a BAMS degree and a stethoscope in his neck. That's the physicians and healers. But they have to work with the material for them and that come the medicines that they have to work with. What we see here in the lower corner is the traditional healer preparing his own medicines in his own kind of vessels so that he can give it to his own patients and therefore he has interest in ensuring that it is effective because he has to ensure that his patient is treated. We see the increasing mass production on the right side but the vessels are not of the modern pharmaceutical kind. They are still trying to make mass level production with the same kind of vessels. What you see here is the modern corporate Ayurveda pharmacy which has a research and development, the R&D division. What you see in the left corner is something like Himalaya producing the herbal plants in their hothouse and on the right you have the lab which is doing pharmacognosy to try and find out which is the active ingredient. So you are finding out one molecule from the whole formulary and the whole formulation that Ayurveda produced as combinations. So now this is not that this is what is tradition and what is modern. This is all available right today for all of us to use any of these in today's India and this is not only India. Various forms and it may not be such so, so much of range, there may be some differences but this is what you find across the world and it's being more and more uh, documented and understood that this pluralism has to be built upon. Um, but if we look at the policy makers and what we did in terms of uh, deciding how our society would deal with this. At independence we had three kind of plans before us. One which one can call the international state of the art uh, con uh, conceptualization which was that is the ultimate five year doctor who has to be there the, the licentiate is banned and there is no truck given to any of the other systems of medicine that is the Bore committee report which formed the basis for the development in independent India of our health service system and that is part of the Nehruvian model of development we have a second one which was the Chopra committee which sort of talked about how the traditional systems could get integrated into our uh, into the larger system and they came uh, with the political support of the uh, religious fundamental identity groups uh, which would see post these as tied to the religious background so ayurveda got tied to hinduism and uh, yunani to uh, islam and so on um, and the third was the frame which said that we need to develop from the bottom up from where people are, include them in it, not have a fetish about technology, take on whatever technology seems important and meaningful in our context. And the Gandhian frame is what that kind of understanding is largely uh, available to us in our context. Between these three, what, the, what we came out with finally as policy was the dialogue between these three. Because there was political uh, support behind all three and there was a dialogue possible within our kind of polity and the kind of independence movement that we had had. And thereby we got a whole separate uh, support from the government to the traditional systems. We have seven recognized uh, uh, systems of health which no other country has. Uh, so th that's the uniqueness of our position even today. Uh, but what we got was a very undemocratic pluralism. Because we, the, what the budget is one way in which the government announces its priorities. And what it gave to the other systems was 3% of the entire health budget. The rest of it was to modern systems. When AIDS came, 4% was for AIDS control, but only 3% for all the Ayush 7 systems and all their hospitals and dispensaries. And yet we see the kind of development uh, that we are seeing in these pictures and which we know in our lives. 
and the experience around us. But what the message that that kind of a mindset gave, and it wasn't only the government, there was a large intelligentsia who also had that mindset, and the public health programs, the way we then brought them on with that understanding, is what provided a large message to the larger population. Development and what the planning uh, planners considered was also development as culture change. And it was about culture change, about changing people to bring them to be able to use these to the best possible. And therefore, from health education to behavior change communication to social marketing, we have the whole range of attempts at educating and changing behaviors, thereby changing cultures right through with this. And today it moves from there to commercial marketing. And commercial marketing of health goods is very largely what today seems to be educating people and people who are able to read and write at least about it. And today the TV and so on takes it to even others. What is it that this kind of development did? When we started with this understanding that we need the five-year doctor, we had to have the All India Institutes of Medical Sciences as priority and the other medical colleges. We got the medical colleges, but we didn't have enough budget to build the health centers in the villages. So where do those doctors go? They build their private institutions. And when they have private institutions, you build up a large private sector so that by the 80s and 90s comes and the policy becomes to pull back by the state and privatization becomes part of the policy, you already have a large interested sector to move into that. The culture of this modern medicine is illust very illustrative and I'll just give you one example. Uh, we moved the very uh, recently, you would all be aware of the Chhattisgarh tragedy of uh, the um, sterilization operations and 14 women dying. A um, colleague, in, uh, one of the health activists, who is also a head of department of surgery in a leading hospital in Bombay, wrote a very short piece remembering the kind of things that are seen as um, you know, important to do or what are seen as ideals by surgeons today. And one thing that he said was very important to know was the doctors got known by this is the 10 minute doctor and this is the 5 minute doctor. And among them there was competition to become who could do it faster. And that is well known within the medical fraternity. And you know you can see people who are sitting there for demonstrations, for example, when surgeons do demonstrations with news, I think, the time it's timed like a sports event. And the clapping that happens looks like the clapping you saw once the rocket goes to the Mars or something like that. The same kind of clapping happens in those halls uh, by the surgeons and the surgeons to be. So if that is the culture inculcated in the surgeons, then if in Chhattisgarh in a camp you see a speed with which it is done. It's part of the larger culture that it happens and unfortunately it leads to things like this. So when we adopted this kind of an approach, what is it that we have gained out of it? Very clearly we have improved in health in terms of mortality rates have largely gone down. We have life expectancy from 32 years at independence now to 64 plus, so more than doubling. But do we, what do we attribute it to? This is data which is showing you what happened in Europe, because there we have the data. And each of these slides is showing you for measles, for scarlet fever, for tuberculosis, a steep graph downward, and the arrows are where the vaccines or the antibiotics actually got discovered. And you can see that the steep graph comes down. It's very close to having reached the bottom that you actually get the technologies. And the medical technology, therefore, is not the cause for this decline, to a major part of the decline right? in Europe. Now, can we say that for India? Because we started this kind of development at a point of time when the vaccine and the drugs had started becoming available. So then what happened? This is a graph of the death rate and the declines in death rate that we can see here. Is it clear and uh, visible? Yeah. Um, from 1901, the graph is showing you till 1971, decadal birth rates, and you can see a steep decline. A large part of this decline is therefore before independence. And then you have a similar slope of the decline, which means the rate of decline really did not change. So what was all the development that we were doing for health and other parts of development actually doing? This is another one which shows you that after 19, uh, something like 1970, by 2000, it's almost like a plateau. This small declines which happen, but it's not going 
too fast, and it's certainly not going faster than before. So how do we explain this? What we've seen here, malaria was the major killer at the time of independence. 300 million people, we used to have at least 100 million cases and 1 million deaths. And that's huge. We brought in a malaria program which was being done globally and we actually brought it down very sharply in the 60s to almost no deaths. But then we got to the limits of technology. We then got to a point where you see the sharp upward curve that happened in the 60s and 70s and then we changed our program somewhat and we came down and what you now see is a steady level which is the endemicity level and how I would read this is that this is now where we've reached the limits of the present way in which we do public health and the present technologies that we have available with us. So if we want to now decrease this further, we have to think differently. Uh, if we get to food, this is looking at malnutrition, there's been a lot of talk, so I won't spend too much time with it. Only to remind you that one third of our adults have chronic energy deficiency even today and half our children also have that deficiency and about 80% are anemic. So, green revolution and so on. Uh, in fact, if we look at it backwards, one can see that green revolution is one point. Um, the British coming was one point which, are, which broke our ecosystem dietary cycles and green revolution very decisively broke that completely because the whole understanding of the green revolution was the high irrigation areas will produce and they will give to the rest of the country. So the whole notion of ecosystems related to diets, related to dietary patterns is completely broken by this cycle and we see all the consequences of course cereals going out, pulses completely going out, all seeds going out and is that what is responsible for now having full granaries but malnutrition continuing in the way it is. Uh, this is showing us for children and again the data seems to show that in an earlier period, there was in the 70s and 80s, there was a faster decline, but post 1990s and 2000s, we seem to be seeing a slower decline. So how do we, you know, look at the TB after we have this very successful DOTS program, which the world over is saying we are meeting our targets, we are meeting both our diagnostic targets and our treatment targets, and we are curing a whole lot of people. We are actually getting official data which is showing an increase in deaths from TB today. This is a graph for 2000 to 2009. And unfortunately, you can see how after two th up till 2006-07, there's a steep increase in deaths due to TB, despite a successful DOTS program. Uh, this is again to remind you that, you know, therefore, what, is that, what do we attribute this to? Now, uh, attempting to put all this together in terms of the knowledge base that we have as part of health culture, and what happens to it? I don't know if you can read at the back. Yeah? Okay. Uh, what I'm trying to, uh, you know, one point that I'm trying to make here really is that when we read history of science, it gives us one linear view of uh, the in Indian and Chinese civilizations first having uh, discovered and developed health systems, and then the Greek and the Arabic, and then drawing from that modern medicine. But basically, the Renaissance brought the whole modern science and technology into being and therefore it's a linear growth of advance that happens. Clearly that's not what we see in terms of uh, the development of knowledge in health where uh, I'm starting here from uh, the point of uh, the nature workers that is the cowherd and the shepherd and the forest dwellers who even Charak um, and his court uh, uh, can be given here but I will leave it in for time uh, where but he, Charak talks about the fact that it is the cowherd, the shepherd and the forest dweller who has the knowledge of plants and their medicinal value. We have only systematized them. But having systemized them, we are the ones with the knowledge. They only know the plants. They only recognize the plants. We can't recognize the plants but we know their medicinal value and have enhanced their use. So that's the movement from the nature workers to the textual expert. But in between you have the four healers who have picked up this knowledge, some of them became experts in that knowledge with their own interest or with Guru Shishya Parampara or their own family lineage. And so you have this range from those who knew it from their proximity to nature and use of it for themselves to the folk healers, to the textual uh, traditional systems uh, and their experts uh, of the various kinds that we saw. 
the diffusion of this knowledge to different parts of the country, whether uh, across the subcontinent in India, and it's in great diversity and the diverse forms. Ayurveda in Kerala is very different from Varanasi Ayurveda, is different from Jamnagar and so on and so forth. Uh, but also to Greece and uh, the Arab world, and they imbibed that, incorporated that into their medicine, and it goes on then to be translated into Latin and becomes part of the European repertory. And the history of medicine by and large then blots out both the Arabic and the Indian and Chinese contributions and it becomes European medicine post Renaissance. What this modern medical science uh, as it develops in the 19th century is largely about anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, microbiology, uh, moving on from there to nutrition science, communicable diseases, the germ theory. Post industrial revolution you start getting its technologies so which is from pasteurization, water, sewage systems, as I said, to vaccines, antibiotics. The wars, so industrialization and the wars is what are the real push for modern medicine and the way it developed. The wars bringing on the need for surgery, for dealing with accidents, antisepsis, anesthesia, all of that develops much more around 1880s to 1930s. And um, pharmaceuticals which pick up their molecules from plants till the 1950s. So over 150 years, the farm food industry is plant-based. But then it goes on and starts picking up the molecules that are being developed by industry for industrial use. And 1950 to the present, they are now testing molecules. So millions of molecules. There's something like a registry which has 3 million molecules. So they pick up the ones that they think could possibly be of medicinal value and test them and that's the expensive R&D that the pharma does and therefore claims that therefore it must add those costs to the molecules that are actually useful. Well, this is happening by the 1950s, by the 60s and 70s, we already start finding resistance to the antibiotics. So when malaria coming back in this research is part of the reason that there is resistance to the anti-malarials. And today we are hearing all about the resistance from the New Delhi. Uh, bacteria and so on as well and it's uh, becoming a bigger and bigger problem across the world. Uh, also you got other kinds of problems with agriculture and the chemical use in agriculture and in industry, toxicities, cancers, all that increase, non-communicable diseases increase, stress related diseases increase, what are called lifestyle diseases and therefore what we are seeing today in uh, the development of medical and health knowledge in the expert form is really back to a convergence of the modern and the traditional where you have um, what is called systems biology today coming in uh, talking about not different parts of the system uh, what modern medicine brought was mind body divide within the body each organ and system for itself now systems biology is claiming it's looking at the interactions and metabolism in an interactive way um, and a large part of the ideas of this comes from Systems like Ayurveda or Chinese medicine or others that have laid down this kind of theoretical frames. It's also coming back to saying since antibiotics are now becoming useless, the idea of um, strengthening natural immunity is of the body. And that again, these systems obviously have strengths in that uh, because that is what they had developed with. Uh, you have the pharma industry now not having any new molecules or directions of research. They are certainly not... Uh, this, um, studying new antibiotics, for example. That's not the direction of research any longer. They're looking now more for the herbal. The chemical is more expensive. The herbal is being done by bioprospecting with the traditional communities, with the Adivasis, get their knowledge because they already know which plants are medicinal of medicinal value. And if you, the uh, data that Foundation for Research in Local Health Tradition and others have put together shows us that even the traditional texts have something like 1500 plants in them in total in the Ayurveda text while if you document what uh, communities and folk healers know then it becomes something like 6500 plants. So the textual of the traditional have seen themselves as experts but they also do not have the knowledge that is still there with the folk. Uh, so that, that is what the bioprospecting today is about. Now that brings new problems because today pharma has also claimed patents. Now it's claimed patents for modern system, it will have to give that for the traditional. Now if it has to do that, who does it give it to? And therefore the whole issue of 
access and benefit sharing, which is a big part of international discussions in, uh, for biodiversity conventions and so on. How do you actually deal with this issue? How do you pay back to those who have this knowledge? Um, so these are sort of the kind of situation where we are today and this is therefore one stream in the development of medical culture as it is developing today, which seems to me to be a positive where it's taking the plural ideas and it's the modern science is actually growing and developing in a spiral form. What is happening to the traditional systems? Because it is also interacting, it also has its own spiral of development. Unfortunately, it seems to be interacting and thereby picking up the anatomy, physiology and so on of the modern, uh, which is the, in the dichotomized form, and itself adopting otherwise the organizational structures of the modern. And thereby it now picks up medical education, and you saw the product of that. Uh, there is the pharmaceuticalization, which means instead of the uh, physician producing their own medicine, it is now mass scale production. Therefore problems not only of is the quality adequate, also the whole issue of raw material and the extinction of raw material because the plants are being over harvested and getting destroyed um, to the diagnostics. Now this again the diagnostics since it's being done at such a large level and people one speaks to of the traditional practitioners seems to see it as a positive that may be one which actually adds to the spiral of knowledge and addition to the traditional systems. What happens to the folk knowledge part of it? Uh, this is where now the choices are wide open, all four are available. You have their own experience from which they draw and build their understandings. There are the folk healers and practitioners who even today continue to interact with their elders, with each other and to grow their own knowledge and their own skills. The codified traditional knowledge which is becoming the most uh, narrowed in its scope of knowledge uh, in the present and modern medicine which still seems to be growing by imbibing the traditional. In this whole cycle, uh, if we look at the spiral here, while the traditional is being integrated into integrative medicine and a whole lot of research is going on in that, the natural workers and therefore their knowledge, folk knowledge is being incorporated by the pharmaceutical and uh, attempting to get benefit sharing with them who seems to be losing out in this process is the folk healers. Because they are neither on this side nor seen on the other. Some of the folk knowledge may be picked up from them, but then it's knowledge as total community knowledge and not their only theirs. And therefore they are acknowledged neither by the formal system, they are not part of any of the recognitions that have been given by the government, and neither are they acknowledged by the commercial. And yet they are large part of the providers of healthcare, in rural areas and to the poor today with skills and two examples that you will immediately um, uh, you know, uh, recognize is one of dyes and birthing which is still largely done and therefore when you have a government program come in like the Janani Suraksha Yojana which pays women to go to for institutional delivery you still have after 8 years of that 30% women are still not coming to institutions by official records and Unofficial records tell you how this is more on paper and what actually happens is something else. Uh, and a documentation of the skills that the guys themselves have. Um, two? Uh, sorry? Is it the co with the most of it is fake, even not? I'm not saying most of it is fake. I'm sorry, I communicated that. Uh, no, he's saying that when the governments say it's 70%. Yes, there has been a large movement, but there has also been, some of it is also the other way around and we could, the choices are made by people, not only because of the money which comes to them, but otherwise as well by their other experience. And the other experience is documented both ways. Because where you are calling them are hospitals which may or may not have doctors and so on, as one part of the story. The other of course, like I said, is that we have had improvements in mortality and so on. So one is not denying the benefits of modern medicine anyway, that is not what my attempt is but that we need to recognize it in perspective of as much as it can give us within our context and our settings. Um, so in this now, where are we? And I am uh, summing up with two or three or four images maybe. This is the Ebola and you already as you said had a discussion on it. This image is what tells us the two sides of where we are with health culture today. This very sanitized experts with self-protection and this 
African child whom they are holding tightly by the hand, looking at them, maybe with a little wonder, with awe, wondering what this is about. The other is the CDC telling you, don't panic, there's no need to panic, but themselves are really panicking and doing things in panic. And they're saying this because they know the communication to the public must be, don't panic, don't panic. So, therefore, there is this message. The other side, you've got, like I said, in the expert, you've got a system of biology and the herbal and all coming back. In people's culture also, books like this now have become very popular. And they're being more and more written and more and more are being bought and used. So, Dadiwan is home remedy. The Dadiwan may not be there in the nuclear home any longer, but the home remedies uh, are attempting to be learned and developed through this. Now, what is it that the commercial marketing sector is telling us? Because that's the current form. We, if we look at the legitimizers in the cultural sphere of health culture, what we see is uh, religion is one of the big legitimizers earlier. We had the state for the last uh, 400 years or more. And now it seems to be the market more and more as the legitimizer, whether through the state or directly on its own. And uh, I end with just a few of these, maybe not sure if show all of you, uh, all of them, but uh, one where health seems to have become a big issue for the middle class and the paying middle class, this video con ad, if you look at this corner here, can you read it at the back? Hmm? It's talking about giving you vitamin C in the healthy air that you'll get from video con. <laughs> now, how do you breathe in vitamin C is a puzzle to me. Uh, <laughs> huh? You've got this, which is talking about health and happiness and a whole lot of Ads, but what you, uh, among which uh, it's from remo de addiction, removing stress, to um, what you see here of up to 75% of uh, yeah. uh, hair coming back. Yeah. And we have uh, our prime minister who uses this technology for image building, mm -hmm. and we have other ministers who use liposuction and bariatric surgery for uh, similar kind of things. Um, we have this, which is uh, for screening uh, and screening. When is it best done? When you have none, no problem. <coughs> the sunshine vitamin, which is giving you Wednesday vitamin offer. Why is it a Wednesday vitamin offer? What is the vitamin offer? Instead of 1000 rupees, you'll get a 500 rupee package. Why Wednesday package? Any guesses? Why Buddha? Because it's a lean period for them. But normally you go on weekends to get your checkups done or blood given. No? You don't go on weekdays in Delhi. Uh, so, so when is it? So their worker is sitting uh, idle and you're losing money. So you say even 500 is better than nothing. So we do it for 500. So uh, uh, now this is Nestle. And if some of you will remember, 20 years ago there was a big campaign globally for uh, not using Nestle because they were promoting. Uh, other than breast food for children. Right? Now this is ads uh, with Times of India, they put in ads where they're talking about, uh, it seems partly to be, uh, you know, it's talking about the first thousand days uh, of, uh, the next one will do that for you, show you the thousand days which are the most important for children and their growth and nutrition. Uh, while this is medically part fact, what they further want to tell you is, how do you then deal with this issue? And in the other one, you can see they're talking about the role of the mother being so important. But what is the accompanying message? The accompanying message down here, can you read? Or in the next one? To know more about the importance of first thousand days, talk to your doctor. So now, child feeding, you have, to talk, you have to talk to your doctor, is what Nestle advi advises you to do. Um, two minutes more to give you some little bit more flavor of this. Uh, yeah, you can see that as well. Huh? The very secular and plural. The children are... Like this, like this, and like this. Can somebody come and help me with this? Why is it not moving? Okay. Okay. Sorry. 
you have this side which is talking about this DHA is a molecule uh, which is being propagated by some scientists in the US and it's being sold here by Religate. <coughs> this is about intimacy begins with the perfect body and therefore weight loss and body shaping under medical supervision with perfect wellness clinic. So it's actually a perfect wellness clinic, it's not a medical center which is advertising this. And you have Amitabh Bachchan telling you, regular diet, morning walks and exercise are not enough to keep you fit. You have to hit NutriCharge, man, to actually have good health. NutriGo, but Dabar is doing NutriGo. And then you have this, which is the skin clinic, which is saying now Delhi is fat free. And how do you do it? With liposuction and so on being done. And in a few minutes, you can move from this to this. And then you have the other side. You have Apollo Clinic, the medical clinic, saying they will do walk-in, chat with us, listen to music, while we transplant your hair, fastest recovery time, call for special discount. Okay, so we have both sides of it. You, one, you have complete conflating of the medical and the cosmetic. Body images, Intimacy, everything gets conflated into this medical technology and what it can do for you. That can move you into, I will not uh, enlarge this but tell you, this moves into maternal care, birthing and surrogacy. And so now you can use others' bodies to get your children as surrogate mothers. And then finally you can do robotic surgery. So you don't need the surgeon to do the actual surgery, they can sit in a machine like this with their head in the machine and robots will do the <coughs> surgery for you. These are the list of references from which these ads came. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've had a, um, the entire field of medicine across cultures uh, Personal questions, market, capital, and what you have completely mapped for us to think and reflect over, and I think it's uh, a huge plate to digest in, in a small time. Uh, but to to focus and get some discussion for it, I think it's one of the things that she uh, wants that is feedback uh, on what she's been saying. I would like to highlight a few issues and maybe start off the discussion. Would you like to say Anything? something? Would you like to say something before you go? Any comments? Any suggestions? Please, that would be any difficult. criticisms that you may want to give?
she can show it. Even the Horlicks and Compline advertisements, those are not really true. But what it is doing, the even the poorer class people, they think that when the um, uh, rich people are uh, feeding their uh, um, babies with this, why should we? And our baby will be that brilliant and like this. Even if they cannot take um, food, they are trying to buy these things for their children. So it is very, very dangerous. But now I became, I may basically, I am a professor of gynecology, but now I am this session, uh, this is the first time in my life, I am an MP, member of the parliament. So probably I got now a chance to raise a voice in this, but I know that so many things are associated with, not only because of these uh, food products only, or the scalper and all these things, uh, but also I think about the races and all which keeps a wrong impression and we, uh, different, uh, also so far the health is concerned. We should think about it. I think you should have the Jamia um, students who are there who are studying and especially you people can help me the, how um, I can raise these questions. Okay. Thank you all. And uh, I'm really overwhelmed to see so many um, listeners and you can well imagine the, how you spoke so that everybody stays still myself after at 10.30 uh, I went to parliament and stay where I come from parliament. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Such but my she only was speaking is that our health, government health system Mostly still doing the English system. So if we want to introduce this, it's a huge cost first of all. But what yeah, I, I think you must be knowing that because they haven't got a government sector, Ayurvedic or we have the separate things, usually they are being posted. Yeah, at least in Bengal, I'm Bengali. Uh, in Bengal they are posted yes, along yes, with yes, the yes, and what they do, they do supply what or prescribe the uh, uh, English system of medicine, not the homeopathy or anything. Yeah, I just uh, flag off some, some issues for starting the discussion. Uh, from the standpoint of an ordinary citizen who is not so well equipped with language, with technical vocabulary, uh, to understand the complexity of the whole system. Uh, the sense that I get is the, the amount of resilience that we have, or our vulnerability is increasing day by day, and we are losing a total sense of our own body, our own nutrition, uh, and our own sense of what it means to be healthy and to be healthy. Uh, the question really is that for most of us, even if we are rich and even if we are affluent, the medical system is very, very tyrannical. Uh, it is, uh, I think, foremost in demolishing uh, your sense of who you are, in demolishing all your hard works, earnings for the entire generation, and leave you completely uh, with nothing at all in hand, not even a sense of yourself. Now, in such a situation, uh, the the question that occurs to me is that when 95% of the population of this country cannot access the medical health services, uh, the question of health needs to be posed uh, in a way that it was suggested to us. Uh, the prime idea that I'm taking home here is that there is an ecosystem uh, of which we are a part, and if we don't get a sense of that ecosystem, uh, we don't have any sense of uh, who we are and what health is. Uh, and if I was to flag off uh, a, a discussion by saying, what would be a good index for saying I am healthy, without getting into diagnostic parameters, without getting into the complexity of how systems work and whether I should be it or not. I want to give you two examples from uh, my own work in uh, forest areas and another from a personal friend. Uh, this friend of mine, his father was an Ayurvedic 
specialist, and he went to visit his children in Atlanta. And they got all his tests done, and his readings were perfect. All the readings were perfect, and they could say, wow, perfect health in Indian, such lovely uh, statistics. He came back to India. In five days, he got an infection, and within a week, he was dead. So, we were all left wondering, okay, what were those diagnostics for and what did they actually say about the condition of the body? And one of the conclusions that his uh, children came up was that uh, these systems actually do not tell you how resilient you are. Uh, they can only approximately tell you uh, how strong you are or what you have. But what you don't have, that you need to build up, you don't know. And this complements uh, uh, with another story that I have to tell you. Uh, having lived in forest areas, uh, there was always this question, who is healthier than the other? These young boys competing with each other, they are trying to figure out who is healthy. And one interesting thing they said was that whoever recovers from exhaustion the fastest. So they would subject them to huge amounts of work and then wait and watch who recovers the fastest. And the one who recovers the fastest will be the heaviest. And this holds true not only for work, this also holds true for illness. So if you fall ill for a fortnight, and if it takes you to recover another two months, you know, then there is something wrong. You take a dose of antibiotics and you have to take, you take a dose for, uh, for one, one course for a week, or say one month, and then you take another dose of another set of medicines for six more months to recover from the after effects of antibiotics, then there is something seriously wrong with this. And I think all of us go through this, and we are not able to take a decision to not be part of this system because we have no confidence in our own judgment of who we are and where we need to go. I think that is the gist of uh, what I uh, can get from uh, uh, through this talk, that uh, you know, all this pithora is actually taking away from us our sense of who we are. And that is, I think, the biggest problem for understanding health. We don't know what healthy means. You know, in Delhi, if you lose weight, you say, oh, wait, my health come away. If you put on weight, you are a healthy man. So a lean, thin man is not a healthy man by standards of some class of people in, in, in Delhi. So with these sort of uh, observations and reflections on what Ritu said, I, I request everyone to participate and uh, give their suggestions, comments, experiences. Please, if you could say your name as well. And, Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I would like to thank Ritu Madam for all her knowledge and wisdom. You are still just smiling and you are a happy woman. I came a bit late and in your lecture, I didn't understand one thing about upper castes banning animal meat and the Brahmin ecosystem because I am a health educator as well and I get a lot of, there is a certain increase in veganism as well in urban cities. So, uh, can you explain the uh, caste system being attached to banning or uh, adopting as, uh, animal meat or animal products? And uh, if you could shed some light on veganism. Veganism? Yeah. Uh, when people don't, think, when they say milk is poison and milk is blood and so on and so forth. Okay. Want to take some questions? Then? Uh, we can take yeah, some more questions. Yeah, yeah. yes. Quick question. <laughs> so, here, there, such in there. It's been such an educative, mind opening for me. The, it was too much and would take time to digest what has been spoken. You know, it is the spiral has been actually spinning through. And many a myths about the modern medicine have been, you know, exploded also. I think it's my only, it's my way of thinking, but you know, now it is when it is rationally put before me and I have the graphs to see the things, then you understand certain things, evolutionary path, fine, but there are many things which medicine as the, you know, and all does, and we are wondering, we are being told, but we don't find that, and it is when you said particularly, you know, about the disease when it is already epping, it's that's the time when the discoveries are made. So what is responsible for that epping of the disease also? So I, in fact, am very curious to know what would be the reason if the discoveries are done, you know, out of phase with what happened. Is it a natural cause or whatever the explanation can be? Explain that. Thank you. Thank you. 
I thank you for the talk. Um, so I had a more of a, uh, I guess, an observation. Um, I would disagree with uh, Mr. Sachi's statement that we're, we're not a, that we're living in a time which which we're less aware of our bodies. I think the the institution of medicine has always had this uh, patient doctor divide. The doctor is the one who tells you what's happening, what's wrong with your body. And I don't know much about traditional medicine or Ayurveda and how it is practiced, but my understanding is was that you went to someone who told you what is happening and they gave you the medicines that you needed to take to get better. Um, so this hierarchy has always existed in some form or the other. And our uh, inability to, uh, to work ourselves out of it, I think it speaks is not just for the current period. Um, so maybe you could reflect on that. It is a very social uh, relationship. Our health is not our own. We know whether we're healthy or ill based on what others tell us, um, and in relation to how others are performing. Uh, as you said, your example of the exhaustion that men, uh, the boys are putting themselves up. So it is a very relative subject. Uh, so maybe some thoughts on that. Take, take the yeah. okay. um, let me begin with the last point first. Um, what you said about uh, not knowing what it, that health is a relative thing is absolutely clear. I completely agree with that. And you know, said the example also I gave you three different reference points that they have. You know, we all have reference point outside, but we also have reference point inside. So uh, that we can do ourselves. That's not necessarily related to the outside. And uh, the doctor-patient relationship has been different. If you look at it, uh, you know, in different systems itself. Uh, if you look at, let's say, um, you know, even within the textual, you're looking at the uh, what was seen as criteria for quality. Hmm? Quality standards today is about, you know, if you have a degree and you have an MD and a specialist, that makes you more qualified and better doctor than if you are a simple GP and so on. Then, um, Ayurveda text would say that quality of care comes from a good doctor, good nursing care, good medicine, and the patient himself or herself. And only if the four together are good and work together will you get good quality care. Right? Which that is inherently building the patient into the process. While today you can come up to the robotic, where even a doctor-patient relationship need not get built. You have telemedicine, where you can now send across by a machine and you will get answers by phone. Right. So we've reached a point where there is a different degree of difference between the two. While it is true that everyone at points of time will need specialized care. But how much of it to what degree? And when is it that we are familiar with our own body? And you know, there are points where uh, uh, and different people and different cultures, that's where the cultural differences would be. How close do you feel to nature? How, full do you, how close do you feel to listening to your own body? Are you attuned to listening to your own body? And I think your answer it's coming from is not just, it's your generation. <laughs> it's not just an intergenerational issue of you and me. Uh, but the fact that over now, if we look post-independence, three generations at least, which have been, have seen only this kind of public health and this kind of message. And the biology we've all learned is only modern biology. So we don't know where Ayurveda comes from. We can't understand its language. Because it's not the same biology. It's saying there is body, mind, and spirit. Now, how do we understand that in biology? We can't. So it's something mumbo jumbo. Right. But that is what put the patient in the center of the treatment process. And there, and homeopathy does, and so on. One can look at other systems as well, which do that. So, but by the time now, your generation is at least three or four generations from that time, and each generation imbibed this more and lost some of the old. And thereby, by this generation, of, and I can see it, say, for example, in my students over the last 20 years. 10 years ago, the kind of, uh, you know, understanding they came with. Now, it's a much more medicalized understanding. And they can almost not understand the critique or the limitations of modern medicine. You know, there's just no questioning of that now. Because 40, you know, four generations down the line, that's how the old has been delegitimized completely or ways that you can do yourself. And not only the commercial, but even the public health doctor will tell you, you should come the minute you have something, but even before that you must have your checkups. Right? So therefore that is the, mess, the, the way the communication is happening and culture forms that. You know. So I would say we need to in fact 
in school get children to understand to learn the skill of listening to your body that's a lifelong skill that children should be given so that they you know do that and are conscious about their bodies and what it means and what it requires what ha the harms to it and what doesn't are issues which each one of us you know learns by dint so it can be made more skilled by actually making it part of it. Yeah. Uh, sorry there were two other questions first um it's about caste and non vegetarian veganism uh, well there is a larger understanding that brahmins don't eat meat and it's the lower caste who do and the lower caste are only allowed to eat carrion which is dead animals and this so that's one kind of you know lit which came uh, the uh, there is a very large variation across the country so it's very difficult to say what exactly uh, but uh, the uh, today's brahmanic upper caste and more and more hindutva mind is saying there is one way which is no uh, cow meat and therefore ban cow meat uh, while it is been not only allowed it is given as component of medicines in ayurvedic texts so it's not that it's traditionally it has not been used it has been used and uh, like i was quoting uh, you know the uh, marvin has earlier for saying how the meat is used and other parts are used uh, by large sections of people but so it's the mindset which is saying that cow slaughter must be banned across for everyone which sees only one way in which things can happen the pluralism is to be killed and only one way of looking at these issues is to survive same way diets have to be one this is what modern medicine would also say there is only one balanced diet and everybody across the world will be healthy only if they eat this kind of diet right so in different ways this comes from different messages and the more and more expert you you know and certain uh, ideologies which see universal and centralization of knowledge and control as ways of social development would espouse these kind of things and uh, now those who are protesting that so you are having uh, in universities in hyderabad and uh, in jnu as well we had dalit groups saying so we'll do it as a dissenting campaign and thereby in the campus and openly have days of festivals where we eat beef now it becomes therefore a confrontation between these two one trying the trying to push it as ban complete ban the other saying therefore we will make it a symbol See, so that's uh, in the current situation yeah the question has been given so america yeah. has said that uh, the human genome project the american project says that 80% of human dna matches the cow which is somewhat related to the other i mean maybe it could be a system of control not really they don't say the cow is like us and therefore we have to say it <laughs> that's not the theory at all so uh, it's a different one and genes yes up to uh, you know more than uh, for a lot of mammalian species is more than 90% that you have commonality so that doesn't mean that it makes them like us or so the argument there is different for veganism yeah. one is uh, those who are looking at lifestyles different and non violence okay, that's one big source for veganism the other is the way in which animal husbandry and animal products and animal food is now being produced in the west completely stall fed not allowed to graze outside completely unnatural foods with chemicals being given in and so on so it seems one as you being violent to the animal and two you are putting in chemicals which are harmful to us so either way it is not acceptable and therefore those who are making a point to say we are against violence in society and want a non violent world veganism is largely being adopted by those kind of third is climate crisis the that's true that, that, yes absolutely i missed that out in fact there's a whole economics of it and that economics has been worked out where for 1 uh, kilo of meat how many kilos of grain are actually eaten are uh, going so, and human beings therefore don't get that grain and it goes to producing that 1 kilo of meat so it's a much more expensive food as compared to but milk otherwise is good for human beings sorry milk otherwise is good for human beings should be consumed should be consumed or should not be <laughs> see again these are you know i don't think there is any one answer to these most of the time tribal many tribal groups traditionally will not have milk because they say it is for the cow it is not for us therefore why should we have milk but vegetarian yeah i mean you know so 
basically I think we need to recognize the plurality of this and not be tied down to it as one ideological position or the other. But the context and we need to look at what it's doing therefore to ecosystems and from that I, I have a little request. We Magic have very little time. Not take we, we have to be very brief because we are running short of time and we have to leave this hall by the time. Please. There was also <laughs> there was the, yeah. question. I still have one question yeah. left. Which was the reasons for decline that I showed yeah. the graphs before the vaccine and antibiotics came? Uh, well, it's still uh, a bit debated, uh, but there are two or three theories. One is that because they improved their food production systems and therefore better nutrition in the population, so that by itself increased natural resistance and therefore things came down. Uh, the other could be public health measures, came before the vaccines did. So pasteurization of milk, sanitation, all that had happened prior. So it could be a mix of the two, it could be one or the other. We can take one last question, I think there is myself, Jayendra, and I am from Ambedkar University, doing amphibian development practice. Uh, now for my dissertation, I am working with a tribal group called Baga, in district Vindori in MP. So in larger development framework, when you say uh, we deal every day with this kind of notion, when you said uh, when technology enters in the society, health problem comes on surface. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you are in this kind of uh, dealing with a technology every day, in urban areas. So, uh, uh, thinking like a, it's, it's about to mobilize uh, poor people from technology. Uh, urban people can use those facility for them, but we for policy always larger policies for health, for every, anything which is like a, goes for in a subsidized manner in a society. So it is not like we, we are <coughs> ignoring them. What would you say? If I got your question right, correct me if I didn't completely understand what you what you're saying, that if today we say that because of the negatives that are happening because of contamination and pollution and so on, or climate change and so on, we should therefore decrease the use of these technologies, but that will then be depriving the ones who have not got it yet. Is that your question? Huh? Um, now see, one is we have to recognize what is it, what, we have to weigh the benefits and costs, right, of any development that we do. What I said about technologies is two things. One, any technologies, when, when, when a transition in technologies happens, then it changes the way, it has to change the way of life of society because it will bring with itself a destabilization of the previous way of life and thereby some health problems will arise. They may, be, they may not, you know, but pollution is the current one we are seeing because we now, we are in a phase where industrialization is what we are suffering from and use of chemicals is a large part of that. <coughs> so, now we have to weigh the costs and benefits for all of society of which the larger part being ill and having greater illness today are the poorer ones. So when we look at it in a whole, their problems do must get larger attention than those of the better off. Which is not to say better off don't need health care. But the attention must be given to those who have less of it. And what is the nature of the problem that they face? Who is going to get the pollution of the Yamuna River when it goes downstream? It is going to be the slum on either side of it and it is going to be the downstream villages. Can Who is going to... Can, so, can uh, we continue this outside? Okay. It's okay. We yeah, we need to close. Okay. And <laughs> it will be a very long... Uh, Thank you very much.